said, speaking of <laughs> color choices and why they're important, um, let's we are going to uh, launch into our next presentation. So this is the tip of the iceberg, uncovering accessibility issues through UI testing. Um, our presenters are Stephanie Leary from Equinox, Lena Hernandez, also from Equinox, and Jennifer, Jennifer Pringle from the BC Libraries Co-op. Um, I am Andrea Ponce diamond I am your host and moderator. Um, please feel free to use the chat if you have any questions. I will be keeping an eye on both, both chats, um, and I will let our presenters know if anything comes up. And of course, thank you to our sponsors, um, Equinox for the platform, Evergreen Community Development Initiative, and Kipu, our other uh, platinum sponsors, or whatever we're calling them. I should have probably looked at the list. Sorry. Sponsors are excellent. It is the last session of the day. Uh, and after this, uh, I'll be kicking you all out of the Zoom room. So without further ado, <laughs> please take it away. I'm going to stop sharing and uh, please give your attention to our lovely presenters. Screen sharing showing up? It is showing up. It sure is. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this session came out of a uh, real world experience um, where testing that I did um, and reported to Launchpad, which I things just looked wrong to me. Um, but Stephanie leapt on all of those bugs and was like, oh, this is actually an accessibility issue. And this one is actually caused by an accessibility issue too. <laughs> and so is this. So um, today we're going to talk about um, uncovering accessibility issues through just general UI testing um, and how you can help spot these too um, so that they can be brought to the surface so that we can fix them. Um, can you uh, flip to the next slide, Lena? Uh, so here we are. Um, we'll also have uh, the slides available after. Um, and please do reach out to any of us if you have questions after the session. Um, and today our plan is we're going to start with Stephanie taking us through what is accessibility. Uh, then we're going to look at how to check for UI problems. We're going to show some examples. And we're going to end by talking about some exciting changes that are coming soon. Uh, so I'm going to pass it over to Stephanie. All right. So we're going to talk about developer jargon versus everyday people's usage. The word accessibility means different things in different contexts. And the developer's jargon is not always uh, obvious to everyone. So if you hear the word accessibility, you might think, oh, yay, we're going to make it more approachable and easier to use for everyone. And yes, but that term in the world of web design and software interface design, we would call usability. The other thing people hear the word access and they think, oh, permissions and security, like access granted. And that also is related, but that in the world of software development is security rather than accessibility. When we say accessibility, we mean specifically supporting people who have disabilities. In particular, people who need assistive devices to surf the internet or do their jobs or do anything on an accessibility tag on Launchpad, that's specifically what we're referring to. Now, the good news is um, if you were hoping for the first definition, um, there's quite a bit of overlap between these things. So in general, th those of us who do accessibility work say that, you know, usability and accessibility, when we make something accessible, we make it better for everyone. So there's a lot of overlap between those two things. Um, and... Um, Security doesn't have as much overlap, but usability and accessibility go hand in hand. Um, and you can see this in the real world. You know, uh, the classic example is the curb cut in the sidewalk that is there for wheelchair users primarily, but is great for everyone. Joggers, people with small children, moms pushing baby carriages, people walking dogs, people on roller skates, people on skateboards, people on bikes, absolutely 
everyone benefits from having this accessibility accommodation. And it's kind of the same way in software. Um, so let me go through the different categories of disabilities that we're going to be talking about um, and how we support all of these things. So these are the four major categories of disabilities, visual, hearing, mobility, and cognitive. Um, and we're gonna use these little badges as we go through the examples so that you can see that many accessibility issues affect more than one group. Um, so when we fix it for one group, we kind of fix it for all of those. Um, and the cognitive group is very large. Um, it's relatively new to the world of, it, of software accessibility. We haven't had guidelines for it, but this includes not only things like traumatic brain injuries, but also people with sensory processing issues, including anxiety, ADHD, the autism spectrum, and situational learning setbacks, like learning a new language. Um, that can be a huge barrier to using software. So the next slide shows um, some ways to think about disability. We often think of disabilities in terms of like congenital disorders, permanent lifelong conditions, but in reality, they can be temporary. They can be situational. We all have our abilities impacted by temporary life events or the environment that we're in. Um, you know, bright sunlight can make a screen difficult to use. A noisy environment with lots of distractions can make it more difficult to accomplish your task on the screen. Um, and so some of these start out temporary and become permanent. Um, and sometimes they're just temporary, you know, uh, and um, situational. So some disabilities require assistive devices. And we're gonna list a few of them on the next slide. Um, most of us are probably wearing corrective lenses, for example, but we don't even think about that as an assistive device because it's just so normal. It's, it's so everyday. It's built into our driver's licenses that, you know, we have a field for that. Um, but there are many other things ranging from hearing aids to, um, the one that we talk a lot about in web, uh, interfaces is the screen reading software that reads things aloud to people who are, um, visually impaired. We have uh, screen magnifiers that are used by people who have low vision to make the text a lot bigger. We have braille displays, one-handed keyboards. Um, voice dictation software is becoming a lot more um, capable of controlling uh, software applications and not just dictating text. Um, and then onto the, the more serious um, interventions, we have like the one and two button switches that are used by people with severe mobility disorders and eye tracking. So people who really can't move their bodies very well at all can move their eyes and kind of tap on a virtual system that way. Um, and I don't want to intimidate you with list, this list. So the, the next thing, the next question is like, how do we support all of this? Well, we don't have to worry about all of the things all of the time. And I definitely don't want you all to, to worry about that. We just keep a few basic rules in mind. And most of these, the problems that pop up in our web interfaces that affect people using these devices are actually really easy to spot. Um, we have a checklist of things that you can look for if you're being really proactive about it. And if you're doing bug squashing week or, or feedback fest, that can be really helpful to just kind of know what to look for and not go, okay, well, it looks okay. You know, I guess it works. Like having a checklist can be helpful in those situations. But the thing that we want to get across today is that if you see something that is just glitchy and just looks wrong, report it. Because so, so, so often that thing that is a small annoyance to an able-bodied person is actually a very big problem for someone using an assistive device. And if we know about it, we can we can find the bigger problem. So I'm going to turn it over to Lena to talk about how to do the checklist and the bug squashing. So we're going to be talking for most of the rest of today's presentation about some examples of bug squashing opportunities that turned into accessibility opportunities. Um, and as part of this, we actually put together a checklist that you can use, and it is now available as part of the wiki under the accessibility testing page. And um, for those of you who prefer having just a thing you can download, we also have a link to it as a PDF. But essentially, it's just going to give you a long list of questions where you can 
say, does it do this? No. Okay. It's a problem. Let me report it. And they're broken out into different categories, but overall kind of like big picture looking, a lot of the questions are going to be like the ones we have on the screen. Does the layout look wrong? Is it not working as it's expected to? Are the colors really bright and distracting or do they not match the purpose? Is the wording confusing or a little unhelpful? Are there weird border issues or giant buttons or weird cursors? A lot of the things that you, um, you know are weird or wrong when you see them, those are often um, good signs that there's something going on with accessibility underneath. So you do not need to have any type of experience in order to help with um, checking these out or kind of spotting those problems. Really, we just need you to have comfort with opening Evergreen, looking at something and saying, that's weird. Um, that's about the <laughs> level of experience we really need from everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about a few um, tools and tips that you can use to make these um, observations a little bit more effective, but really you don't have to use any of them. You can just use your eyeballs and say, oh, it's not working how I think it should be. And that can be a really great step in helping us identify those types of issues and making lists of them. As Stephanie has many, many, many lists of <laughs> all the things, <laughs> which yes. is lovely when we go looking for it. Um, we will also be sharing this checklist at the back. So I'm going to jump over to the next one. Um, but wanted to point out that we have those lists available on the wiki. So you can go and find them right after we're done talking here. You should wait. Yep. And we'll grab those links for you. So if you do want to go the extra mile or you just want a little backup, like, is this really wrong? There are a couple of tools that you can use um, to do a quick accessibility check on top of the sort of just kind of looking at it and seeing if it looks weird. Um, the, the thing that you can do without really any special equipment is just to use your keyboard instead of the mouse to move around to things and see if you can reach everything um, and, and see if you can press the buttons using the enter key. Um, and then if you want to uh, run an accessibility check using an extension in your browser, or if you use Chrome, uh, the Lighthouse tools that are built in, there's a little accessibility checkbox in there. Turn that on, run it, it will give you a report. Um, these things take five minutes. It's really easy to spot um, accessibility problems once you know what you're looking for. And then the next step is taking them to Launchpad. Um, Jennifer, you wanna talk about reporting Launchpad bugs? Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. Um, so with Launchpad, anyone can create an account and report bugs. And you really don't need to be an expert on accessibility or on evergreen to create a bug. Um, because somebody else is going to look at your bug. And if there's more details that you didn't know to add or were unaware of, somebody's going to comment on that bug. If they realize it's something that's already been reported, somebody will report it as a duplicate. Um, so there's no reason not to report a bug to Launchpad if you find if you find it. Um, as Debbie's saying in the chat, bugs are for everyone. Absolutely. Um, we do highly recommend, and I think it's one of the things actually in uh, uh, some of our documentation around Launchpad in the community. Um, is when you're reporting a bug to include your evergreen version, um, because some bugs will really depend on what version of evergreen you're currently looking at. Um, there are a list of tags that are uh, the official tags, um, and we've got those on the slide here. Um, and there are specific accessibility and UI related ones. Um, so we re recommend um, taking a look at those if you are interested in doing uh, testing around the UI and, and you're reporting those bugs. Um, you'll also see other people again, come along and you know read your bug report and be like, oh, it should have this tag because you know they can spot that. Stephanie does that to a lot of the bugs I report. <laughs> um, and we do recognize that 
searching is not always the best in Launchpad. Um, so there are times when you may find that you report a bug and somebody marks it as a duplicate because you searched, but it didn't come up. Um, and really like, That's there's okay. no, there's no reason not to report that bug. If you haven't found, like if you've searched, you don't find it, report it. Nobody's saying something, you know, bad if they report it as a duplicate. They're just saying two people found this issue and Launchpad did not, uh, was not helpful in letting us know that two people found the issue. Um, and sometimes, one thing, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, sometimes the comments that people leave, um, like in, in reply to a bug report can be a little terse because we're often going through a lot of them at once. Don't feel bad. We really <laughs> just want to make everybody feel good about reporting things to Launchpad um and and getting those in there and don't be like intimidated like oh I don't want to add to the the huge number of bugs no add to it because then we know about it and we can fix it exactly um and one thing with reporting bugs that is kind of like the next level up so if you find the bug in your system there are community test servers that you can go to that are running a stock version of evergreen and test to see if it happens there too. Because sometimes there are things that are specific to your system, um, but if you're not comfortable going and testing it on the stock system, don't let that keep you from reporting the bug. Because worst case scenario, somebody's gonna say, oh, this isn't actually happening in stock. We think this might be local to you. And sometimes you email the listserv and say, is this happening to anybody else? Cause we've been fighting with it for a year. And Debbie responds going, yes, we see that too. <laughs> and then it becomes a launch pad bug. Um, so now we're going to look at some examples of things that we have found, unless Stephanie, you had something to add first. Uh, so we're going to switch it or hand it over to Stephanie to talk about uh, bugs that we've actually found. All right. I lost my place in our script. Sorry. Uh, yes. Okay, great. Color. So we've, we've, we've grouped these into a few different categories. Um, with, we see a lot of things related to color. Uh, and so um, we have a whole tag just for colors. There's three kind of big categories of issues with colors. Contrast, um, the use of color as the only thing distinguishing things that are different. Uh, the semantics of color. What does that color mean? And then consistency across the user interface. So what do I mean by all of that? Contrast. There are numeric values for colors and there is a ratio that has to be met in order to um, ensure that people who have low vision can actually see one color against the other. Um, there's a test for that. It's one of the automated checks that we can do. If you're using one of the browser tools or Lighthouse, it will tell you if there's insufficient color contrast. Um, and then the other thing is that color can't be the only thing distinguishing two things. So when we have a list of uh, items with different statuses, we have to have something, uh, a word, an icon, uh, a border or something, um, not just the background color or the text color to tell those, those different statuses apart. And this kind of becomes an issue when we talk about link underlines. I know people don't like uh, having links underlined when we're looking at a huge grid where everything is linked. But um, for accessibility purposes, when we only have the color of the text distinguishing it from the body text that isn't linked, that's an issue. Um, and so we generally do want to have links underlined. Um, and different systems have solved this in different ways. Um, GitHub recently turned this on as an option. Uh, because they had such arguments over whether or not links should be underlined. They were like, forget it. We're not going to try to solve it globally. We're just going to make it a, a user preference. The, the use of, of color semantically, what do I mean by that? Um, in Western cultures, we associate red, yellow, and orange with danger or warnings um, or like things are going wrong. And we associate green with success or you're good to go, uh, thinking about like traffic lights and things like that. Other cultures actually have different associations with different colors. Um, but 
we want to make sure that when we use these colors in our buttons and our icons, that they convey the thing that most people associate with that color. Um, and so I've been going on kind of a crusade to reduce the usage of red and yellow um, throughout the interface for things that aren't warnings or um, like danger situations. Um, and then the last thing is we want to be consistent and we're not right now. We know we're not, <laughs> um, but this is something that we're working on is like, do we use the same color to mean the same thing across all of the screens? And no, we don't. We're working on it. Um, and then, so next up, I'm going to show um, some examples of the color contrast that um, is kind of a problem. So on the, this is a, this is not a screen from Evergreen. This is a mishmash of uh, some of the Bootstrap elements. So Bootstrap is the the framework that we use. You've probably heard us say this word a billion times. Um, on the left, we have just a list of links, a uh, search result showing some highlights, and then four of uh, the button colors that we use. And those on the left are the standard Bootstrap colors. This is what we were using as of 3.10. And over on the right um, are the changes that I made um, in response to various bugs. Um, we darkened the link color a bit. We like softened the background on the um, search result highlight color, and then we darkened all four of those um, button colors a little bit. Does it look as bright and happy? No, but um, it provides enough contrast that um, people can read it a lot better. Um, and then the next thing is uh, our badges. So the top row, again, these are the sort of stock standard bootstrap colors, and they look exactly like the buttons, which is kind of a problem. Um, the only thing telling you that that's not a button is the size. It's not quite as big um, as the stuff on the previous screen. And they're harder to read, especially when they're very small. Um, so again, we, we kind of treated these uh, just like the search result highlights and, and softened the background a little bit and made that text a lot darker. Um, so those things are in the recent versions of Evergreen. And then um, coming up, we are going to work on the acquisitions uh, item status colors. So on the left uh, column here, column one, those are the current background colors. And then columns two, three, and four are those same colors as filtered through simulators for different types of color blindness. Um, and so um, you can see that column two uh, is the green weak color blindness, which is the most common form. And it is really hard to tell all of those statuses apart um, other than new and delayed. So all those five statuses in the middle are roughly the same almost shade of pink um, to people who can't distinguish shades of green. And column four is not great either. Uh, really none of, the, none of those columns are great. Uh, I actually had a friend who used to work in an evergreen library and I, I mentioned that I was working on accessibility and she goes, oh my God, the act status colors, they're impossible. And I found out that my friend is colorblind, um, which is uh, unusual in women, but there you go. Um, and then, so that's something that we're gonna be working on soon. Next up, we have uh, a very recent bug that Taryn filed. Uh, we, this is in the printer settings screen and that not connected message, yellow on white, it was so hard to see that I'm really glad she circled it in the bug report. <laughs> um, and then uh, I said, yeah, that's bad. And so I grabbed the colors that we're using um, elsewhere for acquisitions funds um, and put those in instead. And the next uh, screenshot is the new version. Um, I also added an icon so that again, we're not using color as the only thing um, to distinguish these two um, types of alerts. So those are some examples um, of color. Oh, I think we have one more. We have the, um, the search term highlights or no, the copy highlights, yeah. Okay, so again, on the left is the old version. Um, and the uh, the blue here especially was just really hard to read. It was so dark that there's not enough contrast um, between the black text and the background. And now I flipped the two on my example and I'm sorry, they're not lined up. Uh, they're not quite equivalent, but you can see I just 
turned down the intensity on those colors. It's the same colors, just at a much lower opacity so that you can actually see the black text um, a little bit more easily. So these are the things that, you know, you might go, oh, that's annoying. It's kind of hard to read. For someone who has a serious vision problem, that's a really big deal. So uh, we're just, like, I, I wanna emphasize, I'm happy to see these things that seem small when they come through Launchpad because not only are they easy to fix, but they address accessibility problems that you know are much more severe for some uh, than the, the person who maybe reported it. The next up, uh, we have buttons. And I've already alluded to a few problems with buttons, but buttons are like a locus of accessibility problems. There's color, there's the wording, there's um, the placement, there's the size, and buttons can be a huge problem for everyone. Uh, for screen reader users uh, who are using a keyboard to move through things, and for people with mobility impairments, keyboard support is essential. You have to be able to click the thing uh, to make it go. And if the button is in the wrong place um, or it doesn't have uh, the right um, keyboard hookup, uh, the wording isn't clear, you know, everybody will be confused about what it does. It won't work. It's all bad. So we have some checklist items for buttons. And you will notice that the one of these things on here has a star that keyboard support is the only one of these six things that the automated tools can tell you. So if you're running Axe or Wave or Lighthouse or whatever, and you want to do that accessibility check, you have to do the other five just by eyeballing it. Because the only one we can tell is whether or not um, it has keyboard support. So is it too big? Is it too small? Is it in the wrong place? If there is an icon on it, is there a tooltip so that you can hover over it and see what that icon is supposed to mean? Um, is the, if it's red or yellow, have we used those appropriately? Um, you know, there's, you're going to see a screenshot later on, but there's just red buttons all over the place. And it's like, ah, um, and then if it gets disabled, does that work as you expect? Does it get disabled in the right situations? Is it disabled when you don't expect it to be? And that can be kind of hard to work through, um, all the different conditions. Um, okay. Next up we have an example of uh, something that Jennifer just filed the other day. I'm gonna let Jennifer uh, talk. So this is, a, this is a current bug. If you are running, I think 3.11 or 3.12, possibly 3.10, if you go to cataloging search by catalog record ID or whatever the menu is actually called, I think bib record, this is what you'll see. And I reported this bug because of a couple things. Um, as you adjust your screen size, the field jumps around in size. It gets bigger, then it gets smaller, and not really in sync with how you're actually expanding and, and contracting your screen. Um, but the main one was because the button. The submit button is underneath. It used to be beside the field. And the alignment isn't great because there's no space for it. To, you know, if it's going to be underneath, it should be spaced from that record ID. Um, so it just looked weird to me. So I reported it as a bug and I was like, this looks wrong. Turns out it's really, really wrong. So this is what I love about these small bugs is yes, we can move the submit button up and that's, that takes two seconds. But when I looked at this screen, because Jennifer had reported the button being weird, I looked at that form field and went, oh God, that's got like five accessibility problems wrong with it. <laughs> the label is not hooked up to the input correctly, which means that a whole screen doesn't work for screen reader users. Um, it's not going to work great for anybody trying to control the screen with Dragon Dictate um, or Dragon Naturally Speaking, or whatever it's called now, um, voiceover, that kind of thing. Um, there's like five different things that are wrong with this. And so just by pointing out, hey, this button looks weird, Jennifer uncovered like a serious problem with the screen that we need to fix. Uh, let's see, next up we have, so this is a recent change that we have made. Um, I went through and uh, carried out a vendetta against yellow buttons um, and some red buttons. 
and got rid of a lot of them. So we now have these two new button styles that we can use in place of those really like loud in your face warning colors. The, the column on the left um, is like kind of a normal button that just does, you know, an everyday thing. The column on the right is a button that looks the same at first, but then you start interacting with it and you realize that it's going to give you a little bit of a warning when you hover over it and when you click on it, um, because this action is going to delete some data or like reset some inputs that you have typed some stuff into. So let me show you how this looks in an actual screen. Um, the next up, we had a screen that Ruth pointed out to me while we were sitting at Hackfest the other day. And this is this is one of those screens where things got messed up in a recent update. Those button colors were supposed to take up the whole button and they obviously didn't. They look like somebody's gone over the text with a highlighter and like not quite filled in all the way to the border. And that's why Ruth was like, ah, this looks bad. But when I looked at this screen again, this is one of those things where um, there were like a ton of accessibility problems with this that I would never have found if Ruth hadn't said, hey, these colors are ugly. <laughs> and so I said, okay, this is a good place to use our new button styles. And so the next screen, we're gonna show you the redesigned version of this. And isn't that just calmer and <laughs> like easier to read um, in addition to you know having the colors in the right place? So that's uh, how we're going to be using these new button styles. They're um, going to start coming up uh, throughout the screen. It's just a little more calm. I call them not so loud. These, to, like I, I'm, I'm in the cognitive disorders group. I have some sensory issues and things are like visually loud to me. It's, it feels like I'm being shouted at. Um, we have another example of something that Jennifer found and reported just because it looked funky. Um, this next one is about keyboard support. And Jennifer found this one because the cursor looked wrong. Oh no, this is tabbing. Sorry, I'm skipping ahead, tabbing order. The patron search form has a number of issues and, and we're going to do several iterations of, of fixes on this. But one of them is that in this one, um, as you, if you were a screen reader user, you would be tabbing um, with your tab key and you would go from left to right and you'd go from the name fields into the name keywords and then you'd land on the search button, which is marked as the submit button for this form. And you'd go, oh, I'm at the end and you'd press submit and you wouldn't ever hear the following form fields. There's like 15 more fields beyond that and you wouldn't know that. So making sure that the forms submit button falls at the end is super important um, for our screen reader users. Um, and it might, this one is a little awkward for our, those of us who are sighted um, because now if we are doing the keyboard, we have to tab through all of that stuff to get to the search form, uh, to the search button. This is a trade-off that we have made um, for our accessibility users. And I think this is going to be an intermediate step. And then we're going to do um, kind of a complete redesign of this form um, in the future. So one of the very recent, like uh, will be coming out in 3.13 fixes is this, this fix for the tabbing order. Um, and then for the next version after that, we'll have something new um, for this form altogether. Uh, let's see, can we, yeah, let's move up one more slide. Yeah, here's the one that Jennifer found. So despite it not looking like it, um, those Q actions are all actions. Um, and when you hovered over them, you suddenly got a cursor to show you that they were actions. I also knew they were actions because the previous version that we were on when I was testing, um, they were all blue links. And then suddenly in 3.11, when we were testing, some of them weren't. Um, so it looked really wrong. And I submitted it as a bug. And we actually, Stephanie fixed this one in time for us to take the fix for our upgrades. So we were really <laughs> excited about that. 
I love it when Jennifer submits these on a Friday afternoon when I am completely brain fried from looking at something big like reports or something. And she submits something that's like, oh, this is the wrong color. And I'm like, oh, fabulous. I can fix that in five minutes. And I did fix it that afternoon and they upgraded on Monday. So it was great. It worked out really well. But this is one of those things where she was like, you know, it's the wrong color and the cursor is the wrong cursor. Like when I, when I hover over those words and I look at it and I go, that's not a cursor problem. That's an accessibility problem with those actions in that those three that are not blue don't have the proper keyboard support, which means if you are using a screen reader, you can't get to those three. <laughs> Whereas the three that are blue work fine. Um, and so we just need to make them consistent and make sure that everything has keyboard support. And in the course of fixing that, we get the color improvement and the correct cursor. So this is like, we'll go fix the more serious problem and bonus, it looks right. <laughs> and we get a screenshot we can put into documentation that actually makes sense to our users. <laughs> All right, we got to move kind of quickly here. So this is another page that I looked at and was like, oh, those colors are so like, We've got warning colors all over the place, and those aren't things that should be warnings. They're just normal. They're normal things. But this um, screen caught my attention because of the colors, and then I tried using it with the keyboard and realized you can't use any of it with the keyboard. Um, you will skip straight from the page title all the way over to those checkboxes. And then because there were duplications in the checkbox list, they didn't work correctly either. Yeah, that interface was a mess. Um, so I fixed it. Uh, it'll be in the next version. There's the new one. Um, and yeah, just calming down those colors and making everything work correctly with the keyboard just kind of makes it all look better just by default. And then of course, you know, if I have time, I'll spend a little time making it look really nice. Um, all right, that is... I think that's it for our examples of random stuff that we have found. And so we're going to talk about a few um, recent and upcoming changes. Um, we've got some exciting stuff. We've got a lot of work uh, that uh, King County Library System has funded over the past couple of years. I've been around for a little over 18 months now, and like a lot of it has been um, stuff that didn't make it into the earlier versions and now like all of it is landing at once. <laughs> so we have this glut of new features. We've got a redesigned grid, which is like the data tables that you see on almost every screen. Um, we've got new reports. We've got the last big chunks of the redesigned acquisition.